An all-new Mercury sedan made its debut for 2006, sharing basic structure and components with the Ford Fusion. Aimed at younger car buyers, the Milan could be equipped with a four-cylinder or V6 engine and became the most affordable car Mercury had to offer by the mid-2000s. And for those looking to minimize their trips to the gas station, a highly efficient hybrid model became available by the late 2000s. In this episode, we're going to take a closer look at the 2006 to 2011 Mercury Milan and also the rise and fall of the Mercury brand. So grab an old time blue pop soda, kick back, and let's get down to the nitty gritty. Throughout its production run, the Sable served as Mercury's badge engineered upscale alternative to the Ford Taurus, slotting below the full size Grand Marquis and Mercury's lineup. The mid sized Sable would have its initial run over the span of four generations, from 1986 to 2005. The nameplate would even make a comeback for a brief two-year fifth generation. The fourth generation Sable, however, would be replaced by two different cars, the 2005 Mercury Montego and the upcoming 2006 Milan. Soon after the Montego went on sale, the Sable was discontinued. Despite being approximately 10 inches shorter and 500 pounds lighter than the Grand Marquis, the Montego was classified via the EPA as a full-size car. The upcoming Milan would be marketed as a mid-sizer, slotting below the Montego. 2002. The designs for the upcoming Ford Fusion and Mercury Milan were submitted and approved this year via Chris Walter. The future sedans will share the same CD3 chassis architecture as the Mazda 6, as well as the future Lincoln Zephyr. Fast forward to 2005, and the Mercury Milan will make its official unveiling at the Chicago Auto Show. The Milan was the first new Mercury sedan nameplate introduced since the 1995 Mystique. The brand's new mid-sized sedan soon entered production, being produced in conjunction with the Ford Fusion at Hermosillo Stamping and Assembly, located in Mexico. 2006 this would mark the first model year for the Mercury Milan. Mercury's new sedan targeted younger buyers and became the most affordable car in the lineup. Overall, the Milan differed very little over a Ford Fusion, but Mercury attempted to separate the two by giving Milan buyers richer looking interior appointments and Mercury specific design cues, such as the waterfall grille. Looking at the rear, the styling was also unique, if not more upscale compared to the Fusion. On the inside, the Milan's upscale aspirations continued with satin aluminum trim and real mahogany as an option. At launch, the new sedan was offered in base and the upscale Premier. For either model, buyers could choose a four banger cranking out 160 horsepower or a V6 good for 221 ponies. The Mazda twin cam inline 4 was at 2.3 liters, while the V6 displaced 3. For buyers looking to road their own gears, they could get a 5 speed manual, but only with the 4 banger. A 5 speed automatic was optional and was the most popular choice with Milan shoppers. The more powerful V6 variant utilized only a 6 speed automatic. By 2007, Premier sedans could now be equipped with all wheel drive. But beyond that year, the Milan sedan remained unchanged. 2010 would be the biggest year yet, with an extensive mid-cycle refresh on deck. In addition to a fresh new look, Mercury's mid-size sedan also got a dose of more power, and a hybrid variant joined the lineup. For 2010, there was now a 2.5 liter inline 4, good for 175 horsepower. And the V6 option now cranked out a stout 240 ponies. Over at Ford dealerships, buyers could purchase a Fusion Sport, powered by a 3.5 liter V6. The Milan, however, did not receive a variant to that model. Also for 2010, the four-cylinder engines got a transmission upgrade, now being paired with either a six-speed manual or a six-speed automatic. Although 2010 was the initial year for the refreshed model, it actually made its public unveiling at the 2008 Los Angeles Auto Show. While the rear of the car saw minor changes, 
Most of the treatment was up front, with major revisions to the front fascia. There was now an enlarged grille, slick new headlamps, and a front bumper. Revisions did not stop with the exterior because the cockpit also got a fully redesigned dashboard. In spring 2009, the 2010 Mercury Milan Hybrid made its debut alongside the Ford Fusion Hybrid in the North American market. Though hybrids were not as popular during the time, Ford's newest offerings were well received by the car buying public. The Toyota Prius was steadily gaining traction in the hybrid market, and Honda had just rolled out its second generation Insight, so buyers were accustomed to the typical odd-shaped hybrid cars. On the flip side, the Milan Hybrid looked like a regular car while delivering excellent fuel economy. The engineers were tasked to create something that felt more than cheap Ford Banger sedans. With the ability to cruise at 45 miles per hour in total silence, the sedans made the driver feel as though they were piloting something special and futuristic, rather than gimmicky and overpriced. And for $33,000, the hybrid was in the price range of rear-wheel drive dynamic standouts like the BMW 3 Series and Infiniti G37. But to be fair, neither of those, or really much anything else, came close to rivaling the efficiency of the Milan Hybrid. Hybrids paired a 2.5-liter four-cylinder gas engine with an electric motor for 191 horsepower total. The refreshed Milan's cockpit had improved interior materials and all-new entertainment and climate controls. The hybrid added the Smart Gauge Instrument Cluster, which consisted of two color LCD screens flanking the speedometer. Drivers were able to select four information modes, most of which involved hybrid power flow and fuel economy. One mode included animated leaves and branches, so the less a driver would speed, the more fuller the animated leaves would be. The execs are hoping to move a total of 25,000 Fusion and Milan hybrids annually. Beginning in spring 2009, Ford managed to move a bit over 15,500 Fusion hybrids and close to 1,500 Milan hybrids, as reported by the manufacturers. For 2010, Fusion hybrid sales hit 20,816 units, making the car the third best-selling hybrid in 2010 after the Toyota Prius and Honda Insight. The Milan Hybrid trailed behind, with only 1,416 units being sold. In total, just a tick over 2,880 Milan Hybrids were sold. After much speculation, in summer 2010, it was finally confirmed that the Mercury brand would be shutting down once and for all. With the closure of Mercury, the Milan ended sales after a brief 2011 model year, with the final one being produced on December 17, 2010. Mercury was successful for many years, with the late 1970s being the highest in terms of sales volume. In the 1970s, Mercury decided to turn their attention to luxury as a way to separate themselves from Ford, especially since by now the car market was changing as well as consumer taste. The Grand Marquis made its debut in the mid-1970s, ultimately becoming Mercury's best-selling model. By 1978, Mercury was enjoying a ton of success, with this particular model year being the highest in terms of sales volume with 580,000 being sold. Fast forward to the 1979 model year. Being based on the Fox platform, the 1979 Capri made its debut and served as the Mercury counterpart of the 1979 Mustang. So in conjunction with the larger cars, Mercury had a bit of success with the new Capri as well. By now, it was the 1980s. And in a response to ever-changing consumer tastes, Mercury released smaller models. Although the Grand Marquis and Cougar were hot sellers, the release of the smaller models proved to be a profitable strategy for the brand. This brings us to the Mercur brand. Pronounced Mercur, the word is German for Mercury. Although these cars were not technically marketed as Mercury vehicles, they were sold in Lincoln Mercury dealerships. But unlike the cars found on Lincoln Mercury's showroom floors at the time, Mercur aimed to provide the luxury and agility buyers expected in a car like the BMW 3 Series 
or Saab 900. Debuting for 1985 as the introductory Mercure vehicle, the XR4 Ti was a performance-oriented hatchback, sharing similar dimensions with a contemporary Mustang hatchback. The XR4 Ti was a slightly modified version of the Ford Sierra XR4i, but tailored for US regulations. The objective of Mercure was simple, target buyers of European executive cars in North America. Though the concept of this sounded interesting, ultimately the sub-brand would be a huge flop. The execs in charge of sales and marketing admitted their mistake and how attempting to sell a German executive luxury car in the same showroom as town cars and grand marquees wasn't the greatest idea, since the typical demographic of those cars had no idea what to make of Mercure or simply lacked interest in it altogether. On the flip side, with the annual sales expected to exceed no more than 20,000 units, an independent dealer network wasn't financially viable. Lincoln Mercury dealers only sold 12,400 Mercures in its first season and approximately 13,600 the next, but sales quickly dropped after that. In an attempt to expand the brand, Ford added the more upscale Scorpio to the lineup for the 1988 model year. Manufactured in Cologne, West Germany by Ford of Germany, the V6-powered Scorpio was intended to give Lincoln Mercury a competitor against European executive cars sold in North America, such as the Audi 5000 and BMW 5 Series, just to name two. The Scorpio was a stylish, upmarket sedan with Euro flavor, but unfortunately, it could not reverse the downward trajectory of the brand. With pricing that peaked at nearly $30,000, Ford only managed to move a total of 22,000 Scorpios for 1988 and 1989 combined. Needless to say, neither the XR4 Ti or the Scorpio gained much traction in America. With only two model years in, Ford ended imports of the Scorpio. After launching in 1985, the consistent dismal sales spelled the end of the brand altogether, with it being shuttered in late 1989. After a bit of disappointment back in the 80s with the Mercure brand, the ambition to sell European-made sports sedans on Mercury showroom floors had diminished. Instead, by the 90s, the execs at Mercury wanted to extend out into other popular segments. The minivan segment was one of them. Going on sale in July 1992 for the 1993 model year, the Mercury Villager was introduced at the 1992 Chicago Auto Show and was a joint project between Nissan and Ford. At first, the Villager was a strong seller, but would eventually fall victim to the decline of the minivan segment, with sales dropping dramatically. A new Mercury-badged SUV model would show up for 1997. Based on the hot-selling Explorer, the original Mountaineer differed very little in terms of design from the Ford variant. The original 1997 was, however, well equipped and came with standard V8 power. By 1998, the refreshed Mountaineer distanced itself from the Explorer with a unique model-specific grille, headlamps, larger wheels, a new rear hatch design, and the 4-liter V6 was now available. The Mountaineer would carry on until the brand would be shuttered in 2010. Though the Mountaineer outlasted the Villager, sales for the SUV steadily dropped from the mid-2000s and on. The Villager and Mountaineer were sold alongside the brand's existing range of sedans, but the projected sales for those models weren't all that great either. For instance, traditional sedans were losing market share at the time, and Mercury sedans struggled to stand out in what was becoming an increasingly competitive segment. And although a new minivan was introduced, Sales never picked up to where they were in the early 90s. Many claim that Ford simply had its hands tied with numerous other brands, hence the reason for the Mercury division was placed on the back burner. For instance, by the year 2000, Ford had acquired Land Rover, Jaguar, and Volvo. At the time, Ford also owned Aston Martin, not to mention part of Mazda. Factory and financial turmoil and a lack of development cash to go around and unsurprisingly, some of the brands will not get the attention they desperately needed. The Great Recession magnified Ford's financial problems. As a result, 
the company was forced to sell those aforementioned brands, but by then, it was too late for Mercury. By 2009, Mercury would move less than 93,000 vehicles, with the brand sales making up only 8% of the American car market. The announcement finally came in summer 2010. Ford would be terminating the Mercury brand once and for all at the end of the year. The final Mercury, a Grand Marquis, rolled out the assembly line in early 2011. Mercury did not have a lot of new vehicle designs to attract customers, but because what was offered from Mercury was so similar to what was offered from Ford, the execs and market analysis felt that shuttering the Mercury brand would not prompt Ford customers to defect to other manufacturers. The two brands' customer base were nearly the same demographic. The execs admitted that most of Mercury's remaining customers were either fleet buyers or those using employee discounts. Despite the shutdown of the brand, existing customers were reassured that Ford and Lincoln dealers would continue to service their Mercury vehicles and honor warranties on them. With the Mercury brand now history, Ford would turn its attention to the Lincoln luxury division. The plan was to redirect the financial, product development, production and marketing, and sales and service resources that were freed up with Mercury's shutdown over to the Lincoln brand. The extra boost was intended to push the Lincoln brand and have it go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the likes of Lexus, Cadillac, and even BMW. Derek Kuzak, vice president of global product development, mentioned how future Lincolns would not simply be badge-engineered Fords but would be designed and engineered to be Lincoln with unique Lincoln-specific technology and features. Ultimately, cars sold under the Ford brand would now fill a void left by Mercury's entry-level offerings. As always, thanks for coming out to the show, and we look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Until next time, this is your host Rob, and thanks for tuning in to Antique Tanks. Thank you.